Hello and welcome to a new edition of In the District. Today we're talking to State Senator Kevin S. Parker from State Senate District 21 in Brooklyn. We will discuss in what ways his district mirrors what's happening in the Bronx and citywide. We will also talk about his advocacy for community media and we'll learn more about his life and work. I am Javier E. Gomez and this program is brought to you from BronxNet's brand new media and technology studios at La Central in the South Bronx. Welcome, Senator. Javier, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure that you could join us here today. First of all, you just did a tour of our brand new uh, studio yeah. and educational facility at La Central. What are your thoughts? First of all, it's amazing. It is exactly the kind of facility that our communities need and deserve. Uh, it's a place not just for um, folks to be able to get, you know, information, news, entertainment, um, but also workforce development. You know, there's a lot of, you know, impressive um, training that's happening here um, for both community members and for people out of school looking to make media, you know, their chosen career. What is the importance of community media networks like this? I know that you're from Brooklyn. Yes. Uh, Brooklyn has bricks. Yes. Uh, Queens has its own network as well, yes. uh, QPTV, right. if I'm not mistaken, and Manhattan also has uh, its own. Why do we need mm -hmm. institutions like these? Yeah. You really need, you know, especially in this day and age where media is you know, everywhere, right? And, and you know, people are consuming more videos, more information. I read somewhere a couple of uh, months ago that uh, a person who reads the New York Times now um, you know, on a Sunday, has consumed more information than somebody in the Middle Ages consumed in their entire lifetime, right? And so, like, this is a information age, and people are consuming their their information a lot more um, through media, through streaming services, through um, apps on their phones. Um, and so, it's really important that community members are part of that conversation. Right now, that conversation is primarily dominated. Um, by big players, right? Streaming services, you know, cable services, network TV. Um, and so this gives a, a, a little small piece of the pie uh, to the community so they can tell their own stories and so they can help be part of the artists that shape the images, um, you know, of their lives. You introduced what is called the Community Media Reinvestment Act mm -hmm. at the State Senate. Yeah. Can you tell me, please, what this legislation is and, and, and what does it do? Yeah. So organizations, right, like BronxNet, um, are really funded through, um, you know, television, you know, the surcharges and that kind of thing, right? Um, and right now we're kind of moving away from that into more, you know, streaming. It's kind of things I just talked about: streaming, things on the internet. Um, Is that movement you know, cable. called cut the cable, right? Right, right. <laughs> and so. Um, we wanted to make sure that as we progress in terms of the technology and, and the methodologies that we're using to conserve, um, that, that sorry, consume information, that community access to those, you know, services uh, aren't limited. And so, you know, we're just kind of modernizing what we've already been doing and now bringing it to the next level. Again, in order to make sure that communities like Brooklyn and communities like the Bronx um, are able to tell their own stories, are engaged um, in their own image making, and they're engaged in, um, you, know, uh, you know, affecting what people understand and hear about themselves, about their communities, about their lives, about their cultures. And so, uh, you know, I'm happy to be uh, the Senate sponsor of the bill, and we really hope that in the next legislative session that we'll get the bill both uh, passed but also signed by the governor. What is your perception about how the legislation has been received so far? Mm -hmm. So far, I think, you know, that people understand it, right? Obviously, as state legislators, all of us use um, what's now we refer to as cable access and, and community-based um, media and all kinds of things that we do, whether it's campaigning or whether it's just getting out information. Um, one of the things I did early on, um, um, in my career was that I would film these, you know, 15 minutes or half an hour segments um, in Albany and they would show them on, on, uh, on B, you know, on BCAT, with, you know, uh, uh, what used to be BCAT, but now Bricks. Uh, but, uh, and so that was kind of my uh, introduction uh, to it. So I knew how important it was for me to be able to communicate 
to my constituents about what I was doing in Albany. Um, and so, uh, you know, now that this legislation has come out, my colleagues understand it. They've seen it. They've participated in it. They've been to fantastic places like, like, like this, uh, you know, amazing studio. Um, they've helped support it in, in various ways. Uh, and so we expect to have a lot of support and we expect to be able to, you know, get it over the finish line in the next legislative session. Is there anything that community can do and why should they get involved in issues that, uh, regarding community media? Mm -hmm. Bronx then it belongs to you. <laughs> it belongs to the people who are watching right now. This is your community television. This is your community streaming service. This is your community um, entertainment and news source on your app, right? And so um, anybody can be involved in it. And so even if you're not partaking in it um, as a producer at this moment, um, and you're and you're you know consuming the information. You still want to be able to consume it in this kind of way, and so that's why you should care about it. And what you should do is really reach out to state legislators and let them know that you care about this legislation, and you hope that they will become co-sponsors and they will vote for it. Senator, talking a little bit about your district, mm -hmm. um, 21st in uh, Brooklyn, it's very interesting. It seems to uh, go from areas of central Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. into East uh, Brooklyn. It's a very diverse district. It is. From, so, from Marine Park yeah. all the way to Flatbush, yeah. and then you get little Haiti there, the Caribbean, and very similarities with how certain districts in the Bronx yeah. have the same level of diversity. Tell me yeah. a little bit about your district. Yeah, I mean, first of all, New York is one of the most diverse places in the world. You know, I've traveled to, I think, 44 countries, and um, very few of them have the level of diversity that we have neighborhood by neighborhood, right? Uh, my community is Flatbush and East Flatbush, Midwood, uh, Ditmas Park, uh, Flatlands, Mill Basin, Marine Park, and Bergen Beach, a little bit of Canarsie. Um, and so it's a very, very, um, you know, diverse community. We have a very large um, Caribbean population. We have actually the largest concentration of Caribbean immigrants outside of the Caribbean in the world. Um, largest concentration of Haitian people outside of Haiti in the world. Larger number in Florida, larger concentration in Flatbush. Um, you know, we have a very large Indipments Park, a uh, very large Pakistani community, very large Muslim, Muslim Pakistani community. In Midwood, Bergen Beach, Marine Park, we have a very large Orthodox uh, Jewish mm -hmm. uh, community as well. And so, uh, again, it's very, it's very diverse. How do you manage a district like that, Senator? Yeah. Uh, you focus on the commonalities. You know, and it's, it's what we do, I think, in the state legislature every day when I work with my colleagues um, like Louis Sepulveda and Jamal Bailey in the Bronx. Um, we, we work on commonalities. You know, we don't, we don't see, we don't see, because I'm in Brooklyn and in the Bronx, as different places, right? Um, but we focus on the things that, that we know people want. They want quality education for their children. They want safe communities, right? They want, you know, affordable housing, right? They want quality accessible health care and when you're focusing those things those are not issues that are Bronx issues or Brooklyn issues um, they're not Caribbean issues or ethnic white issues they're not Muslim issues or Jewish issues those are issues that everybody wants universally and so you kind of keep your eye on the prize and as you do that you try to do the most that you can for the for the most people that you can talking about commonalities mm -hmm. uh, how important uh, our alliances these day and age to get things done at the state capitol? Well, it's the name of the game, right? Um, you know, as being a state legislator, I'm actually also the majority whip, right? And so I'm what they refer to as the leader's whip. So I, I, I work for the leader, and, and the leader asks me on occasions to um, help line up votes for various initiatives, right? And so um, the, one of the most important things I learned uh, on, on my way up in politics is that, uh, you know, the most important skill is knowing how to count, right? And so in the state senate, the, the magic number is 32. And so with 32, you can do everything. Without 32, you can do nothing. And so, you know, you have to work with a broad range of people, um, and sometimes on both sides of the aisle. And so we try to, again, work on commonalities, work on, on issues and frame things in a way that create win-win you know, scenarios um, for my colleagues so that we can bring things to the floor and pass them. And I think we've been very successful at that. You know, I, I look at over my time uh, in the state legislature and look at some of the amazing things that we've been able to do from getting rid of the Rockefeller drug law to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know what cashless bail that, that we've done. Um, I look at the, you know, CLCPA, which is the most, you know, audacious climate change goals in the entire nation. 
um, you know, to making, you know, Juneteenth a holiday, uh, you know, in the state of New York, a year before they made it a federal holiday. And those things were, were done because we were able to tap into um, similar life experiences, similar needs for constituencies, and a common understanding that we want to do the most good for the most number of people. There's a very broad variety of issues, mm -hmm. all of them drastically different, impacting certain and very different communities all mm -hmm. across. No, absolutely. Um, you know, people need everything, right? And, and there's no kind of silver bullet for any issue. Um, and there's no single thing that, that you've done. Um, and it's very funny because sometimes, like, this time of year, um, the governor is getting a lot of our bills and she's signing them or vetoing, hopefully signing them. Please, governor. Um, and so sometimes, like, you know, a bill comes up and, and people say, well, what do you think about this? And the governor signed this bill. And you have to go back because... That was months ago. Like we passed that bill, you know, probably you know last year. You know, not well, last year, but during the legislative session, which is from the first week in January to the first week in June, right? And so, you know, you've been away from it. You haven't been thinking about it, and we're on to the next issue, right? And so even after you pass a bill, you're like, okay, I got that done, and then literally, you know, you may have overnight, and then the next day you're on to, you know, um, the issues. And so like. As a state legislator, all of us, the problems of the people in, in the state of New York are multifaceted, thus we must be multi-talented, right? And so all of us know a little bit about a lot, um, but there's usually three or four issues that all of us, you know, can deeply go into and, and know a lot about those issues. And for me, that's primarily energy and telecom issues because uh, I chair the committee. When we return, we continue our conversation with Kevin Parker, state senator for District 21. Stay tuned. Only 57% of New York City high school students are college ready by their senior year. Fifty-five percent of high school graduates either have no plans to attend college or are uncertain that they will ever attend. Thirty-four percent of young adults don't go to college because they can't afford it. Discover what's possible. BronxNet's education programs, internships, and opportunities help engage and inspire Bronx youth and beyond to pursue their passions. Be a part of the BronxNet family. Whether you're interested in our shows, joining a class, or donating to support our mission, visit BronxNet.org to learn more. I remember when the Bronx did not really have a media outlet properly representing the people of the Bronx. BronxNet provides for the community by being a community where people can be empowered to share their voices. We are in a really great place technologically. We've got all the resources that we need to be effective. Whether it's through cameras, storytelling, editing, we have provided those services for 30 years. BronxNet's mission is to be a voice for the community. To educate, to inform, and to inspire. And you can be a part of it. We've built studios for you.
Welcome back. This is a new edition of In the District today, featuring State Senator Kevin S. Parker, who represents State Senate District 21. Uh, Senator, talking a little bit about the issues and breaking them down, uh, you mentioned energy. Can you tell me why this topic is so important for mm -hmm. you and what are you doing in that area? Yeah. Well, I started the, my journey on the Energy Committee 20 years ago when I first got uh, elected and took office. I was made by David Patterson, who went on later to become governor. Uh, the, when he was the minority leader, I, I was given the, the responsibility of being the ranking member, the ranking Democrat uh, on the Energy and Telecommunications Committee. And I kind of stayed on that committee this whole time, I guess now 20 years, and I've been either the ranker when we were not in the majority and now that we're in the majority, I've been the chairman probably about five years. Um, and so, um, you know, I think early on I recognized that there was a lot that needed to be done around both siting of power plants and making sure that we didn't have a lot of pollution coming from mm -hmm. those plants, particularly because they're disproportionately um, cited in, in black and Latino communities and, and our communities, you know, suffer from high asthma rates because of that and other kinds of health effects. Um, but then I also saw the future um, and that sustainable energy was going to be a big part of what, of what we've done and so, or what we needed to do. And so here we are now, we've passed um, the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, again, which is the most, you know, bold and audacious climate goals in the entire country. Um, and although the document is primarily an environmental document, it does speak to the, the need for us to transition to a clean energy economy from the context of um, our energy and our grid. Um, and so I'm the sharp end of the sword as it relates to producing policy on the state level um, to make sure um, that our, you know, that we're doing offshore wind, that we're doing solar, that our um, hydro assets are you know uh, are working uh, properly that you know we're doing all of the things that we can in the state from an energy perspective um, to make sure that we're both transitioning into that clean energy economy but also having enough energy to run beautiful studios like like this one I know we discussed community media in the first segment, but I know you're very passionate about telecommunications mm -hmm. overall. Yes. So tell me, what else is happening in this area? Yeah. Well, the biggest issue outside of making sure that we have, you know, community access is access to broadband. And this was, you know, really raised during the uh, pandemic um, when people couldn't go, you know, to work. And folks were, uh, you know, keeping their kids home and, you know, and, and children were learning remotely, um, it, it just really laid bare um, the digital divide. And, and I refer to it as the second digital divide. The first digital divide is about access to hardware, because part of what we found out then is that most of these kids didn't have tablets, didn't have laptops. They were doing their homework on, on smartphones, right? Particularly, again, in black and Latino communities and, and lower income communities. And so we had to, you know, kind of work on, you know, bridging that digital divide. And then the second one is access to high-speed broadband, where you literally have kids, you know, their families parking outside of, outside of you know, uh, libraries in order to get access to free Wi-Fi. And I think we've done a lot in the committee and in the state legislature in order to address those issues. It's still not perfect, particularly in this, in this you know, particularly in rural areas, actually more than the city, but, this, but the city has some spots um, they're not as good as they need to be. And so we continue to endeavor to identify where those places are and work, you know, with various um, organizations um, to bridge that gap and make sure that the entire city and the entire state um, has access to high-speed broadband. It really now is a right. In the same way that we would not put somebody in a housing situation without water, gas, and electricity, we really shouldn't put them in a housing situation without high-speed broadband. These days you cannot function. Absolutely. Some neighborhoods were not even Absolutely. wired. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me, oh, yeah, let me give you another mm -hmm. good example. During the pandemic, one of the, the, when, they, when the um, vaccine became available, the first group of people who they made available to the vaccine were senior citizens. But the only way that you could sign up for it is that you had to sign up online. I remember. Right? And uh, so as legislators and many city council people as well, our offices became clearing houses, like literally calling seniors and using our, you know, government computers, which is appropriate, to sign people up for the vaccine, right? But it's that kind of mismatch that, that we were dealing with, and we want to make sure that if, God forbid, we're ever in that kind of circumstance, that both our seniors 
and our young people are covered, as well as, you know, you know many communities that may be, again, lower income um, or not, may not be as resource, resource rich, um, have access to, to these, um, these, this is, again, a critical um, resource that we sometimes take for granted. Let's talk about workforce development. Yes. I know that you've been um, uh, sponsoring or, or at least uh, supporting the legislation for uh, working permits for migrants. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about these and any other labor initiatives? Yeah, you know, I, I got into um, politics really because I, I wanted to see my community better. And the first thing I thought of was that we need to create full-time jobs at a living wage with benefits, particularly in black, Latino, Asian communities and among women. Um, a lot of that has to do with our own creating out jobs for ourselves, right? And so I really begin at a place of looking at women minority business development and making sure that these MWBE programs, both on the city level and the state level, are accessible. State of New York has the third largest budget in the entire country after the federal government, the state of California, and then now the state of New York. The fourth largest budget, parenthetically, is the, is the city of New York, which has a budget larger than 48 states, including Florida and Texas, which have populations larger than the state of New York. And when you look at those, the budget of the state of New York and the city of New York, collectively it's almost $60 billion worth of just contracting opportunities. We look at blacks, Latinos, Asians, and women, you talk about well over 50% of the population, yet they're getting less than 10% of the contracts in most times. We really need to be getting them up to closer to 30%. Um, I know the mayor has done a really good job at bringing some professionals that actually have worked on the state level previously and now working for the city to kind of raise those numbers. But creating those jobs is absolutely critical. Again, being the chair of the Energy and Telecommunications Committee, the next best opportunity to create full-time jobs at a living wage with benefits is going to be the clean energy economy. So as we look at offshore wind, as we look at improving our grid, as we look at you know, solar, as we look at you know, doing audits, energy audits in people's homes or retrofitting buildings, um, a lot of these are going to be good union jobs as well. Um, when we talk about you know, what they say clean energy jobs or the, we used to say green energy jobs, they're just blue collar jobs and white collar jobs with a clean purpose, right? And so there's lots of opportunities there and I think it's really important to get New Yorkers focus where the jobs of tomorrow are going to be, get them trained um, and, and use our institutions um, to help kind of bridge that gap between these you know, industries that need workers and community members who need these good paying jobs. For those people watching who might not be very familiar with you or your work, please tell me a little bit about your childhood and your journey to where you are uh, today, the abridged version. Uh, the abridged version. Uh, <laughs> well, I was born and raised in, um, in, in public housing uh, in the Bushwick Projects uh, and lived there until I was about 10 years old when my family finally got enough money to buy a house that I still live in in, in, in Flatbush. I went to public school my entire life, uh, PS193. I went to Andres Huddy Jr. High School, went to Midwood High School. Um, went away to college at Penn State, have a master's degree in urban policy and management for right here from the new school. Um, and, it, and government and politics has always been my passion. I've spent um, 30 years working here, um, everybody from the city council to the state legislature. I worked for the first Governor Cuomo, worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign, worked for H. Carl McCall, uh, first African-American elected statewide. He was a state controller uh, and then got elected to the, the state senate in, in uh, 2002. I was actually the youngest member of the state senate at that time when I got elected. I'm now the fourth most senior person in the entire body now. So times have changed very, very quickly. Um, but I've always had this desire to see both my community better, um, my borough better, the city better, and, and the state better. And so I have kind of committed myself to working with my colleagues um, in order to pass legislation and make policy um, and work with administrations in order to provide services, provide resources, and to make sure that everybody has had the same kind of opportunities that I've been lucky enough to have in my life and to be able to take myself um, from you know where my family brought me, uh, you know, to sitting here with you now. Who would you say, Senator, are your role models? Wow, my mom and dad first. I mean, they were really, really hardworking people. And and older I get, the more I admire their sacrifice and the things that they that they uh, that they brought, you know, to us. Um, I was a big fan politically of Howard Washington, who was a former mayor of Chicago, um, uh, and somebody who I think was transformative in, in the work that he that he did. Um, big fan of 
a lot of mentors that I've had, uh, people like Dr. Yuna S.T. Clark, who was the first Caribbean woman ever elected to the city council in the city, H. Carmel Cole, who I mentioned earlier, who I worked for for a number of years, um, and Hillary Clinton, who I also volunteered for in her Senate campaign. Um, folks I thought like broke barriers, people who I thought were well prepared for their positions, and um, I've tried to model myself in that way uh, to be prepared and, and to be professional uh, in, in the things that I'm engaged in. Goals you'd like to achieve? Wow, um, I, have, I have lots of them. Um, you know, and and child poverty. Um, you know, get us to a, a, a zero unemployment rate. You know, here in in the state of New York. Um, you know, transform the electric grid and make sure that that we have a totally. 100% uh, clean energy economy uh, in the state, uh, you know, uh, uh, three modest ones. Well, three modest ones. That's a <laughs> lot of work right there. Thank you, Senator, for joining us today. No, Javier, the pleasure is all mine. It's a pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for watching. And remember that you can always watch this program anytime, anywhere on bronxnet.org and also Bronxnet's channel on YouTube. You can also share the link with others. And make sure to follow Bronxnet on social media to find out who will be the next leader who we will talk to in the district. From Bronxnet's media and technology studios at La Central in the South Bronx, see you soon. <laughs>